on page 44 of your prescribed textbook. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? Yes. Um, okay. uh, who's um, speaking? It is Sinatemba Kubane. Sinatemba, okay. Yes, I have a question. So I don't know if I'm right or wrong. So is there a condition, for example, maybe, let's say I'm in need, I say I'm in need in food, and then what if I'm the one who opts for divorce and I'm the one who cheated in the relationship? So in that instance, um, will I still be in need because I'm now <laughs> wanting something from someone who I've hurt also? Okay, uh, first thing, let me say we will get uh, another session later on when we will talk about termination of a marriage and then we are going to talk about disposal maintenance under those circumstances. But to answer your question, we have what we call matrimonial guilt. Né? So if the parties or the spouses are still living uh, together and one party leaves uh, the matrimonial home, so whether spousal maintenance uh, can be claimed or not is going to be determined by is there a matrimonial guilt so if you as a spouse or as a wife uh, let's say you had an affair and the marriage is been uh, or the marriage has broken down because of your conduct né? under the spousal maintenance rule you cannot uh, bring in a claim but during the process of a divorce you can bring a claim for spousal maintenance because uh, the divorce uh, system in South Africa or the rules is we have a no fault divorce system. So whether one party, uh, let's say, had an affair or uh, did a certain kind of misconduct, depending on that kind of misconduct, it cannot be used against them. And also we have uh, in law what we call Rule 43, uh, uh, High Court Rule 43, and the magistrate court is rule 58 where a spouse who is uh, who needs a uh, maintenance or uh, an interim uh, interim means a temporary uh, financial support or a, a temporary maintenance can bring a court application for an interim order so during that interim uh, order the court does not look at the merits of the case it does not matter what you did what the court looks at is are you in financial need and can the other spouse uh, afford so yeah so that's how it was while you are still living uh, while you are still married but there is no pending divorce uh, the matrimonial guilt determines whether uh, a case or whether you can bring a claim for spousal maintenance or not but when there is a pending divorce then the rules change you can at the time bring a claim for maintenance okay uh, do you understand are you answered okay, okay. Uh, uh, can we move on because i want now to talk about liabilities against third parties yeah. Uh, it sometimes happens that when spouses, uh, uh, married spouses, one spouse uh, can go and incur a debt and, uh, in the name of the matrimonial home uh, in, uh, for the benefit of, of the family. Now, the question arises as to whether can a, a third party uh, hold the other spouse liable? for a debt incurred uh, for the benefit of uh, the matrimonial home. Né? So there is two things that, needs, uh, that you need to know here. Firstly, if you as a spouse, you go and uh, incur a debt and you pay for that debt. So uh, the third party will hold you liable and if you can afford to pay for it, then that one is fine. But if you cannot afford to pay uh, for it, the third party can bring uh, or the third party can now uh, bring an application against your spouse. So uh, for spouses who are married in community of property, 
because they have one joint estate. When you get married in community of property, we say what is yours is mine and what is mine is yours. So if you go and incur a debt or make a debt, the third party can sue the joint estate because you and your spouse have one uh, estate. But if you are married out of community of property, uh, the third party uh, firstly needs to uh, it firstly needs to be determined whether you as the uh, as the spouse who did not incur that debt did you benefit. So if you benefited, the third party can bring a claim for unjustified enrichment. In other words, you enriched yourself unjustified at their uh, at their expense. So that is the first uh, remedy that a third party has. The second remedy that the third party has is what we call the ne the nego uh, negotiorum castillo. Uh, castillo. This uh, is when a spouse uh, enters into a transaction but for the benefit of their spouse. For example, Tabo and Mpo are married. Mpo enters into a transaction for the benefit of Tabo, but uh, Mpo does that without the consent of Tabo. So now the mm. question is, uh, can a third party prove that what your spouse did benefited and was solely for the benefit of your spouse. Ne? And then if you can look in your textbook, it does say uh, this one, uh, the negotiorum the uh, Castillo has some challenges because it becomes very difficult for a third party to prove that that transaction was uh, undertaken specifically for uh, the benefit of the other spouse, like Mpo, uh, it's difficult for me as a third party to prove that you undertook or you undertaken that uh, transaction so that your husband uh, Tabo, can benefit. So third party is mostly uh, the remedy that they can use is unjustified enrichment because it is easy to prove that uh, this transaction that you have now created a debt upon benefited not just you as the spouse who uh, undertook this transaction, but also the other spouse who was not involved when the under uh, when the transaction was undertaken. Does anybody have any question on what I've just spoken about now? Hmm? Do we all understand? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, now I want us Jessica, to talk. Can you please switch off your camera? Sorry to disturb in Tabi. Okay. Oh, now I want us to talk about uh, a question. Okay. Who has uh, somebody said a question? Does anybody have a question? Yes. Okay. Who's speaking? Palisa. Okay, Palisa. You are listening. Um, I, I want to find out something like, for example, if you are taking a loan, like you are married in, in committee of property and you're taking a loan from the bank, shouldn't the bank uh, ask for maybe your marriage certificate and then ask for your spouse to be there to also sign for the for the loan that you are taking? Uh, okay. Okay, yes. I, I understand your question. Uh, firstly, let me say, uh, when we talk about the variable consequences of a civil marriage, we are going to talk. Uh, uh, but spouses who are married in community of property, uh, they have one joint estate and there are certain transactions that they must consent to before they can be undertaken, one of which is taking up credit. So you are correct that the bank uh, needs the consent of the other spouse. So in most of the time, that is what happens. But it, we have heard that in some certain, in some circumstances, a spouse manages to uh, obtain credit without the consent of their spouse. So under that situation, one can say uh, the fault lies with the bank 
as a creditor and not necessary uh, with the parties uh, or with the spouse because it is the bank's responsibility to ensure that both parties uh, give a consent or they sign the relevant documentation when credit is given. Yeah? So let's say there is a, a situation whereby a spouse uh, realizes that, you know what, now the joint estate is indebted with this amount and I was never given an opportunity uh, to consent to this uh, debt. The spouse can contact the bank and challenge uh, the validity of that transaction. Ne? But I must be honest with you. Ne? We all know that, you know what, the banks have money. Ne? So in a certain uh, circumstances, they will just write off the, uh, the money or in certain circumstances, they will just say, okay, uh, you spouse, uh, challenge us in court. So if you have the funds, you can challenge them in court or you can uh, take the matter to the banking ombudsman. No one. But as a spouse, you can challenge, as a spouse married income job property, you can challenge a transaction or a debt that was uh, taken without your consent. Spouses who are married out of community of property don't have a joint estate and mostly in their antinatural contract. An antinatural contract is an agreement that they sign. Uh, whereby they state the terms and conditions of their uh, marriage, con uh, of their marriage, uh, the, pat the patrimonial consequences of their marriage. So in most uh, instances, they exclude uh, the debt, they exclude a uh, joint liabilities of the debt. Understand? So uh, I hope I've answered your question, but it is the bank's responsibility to ensure that both spouses consent or they sign the relevant documents. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any question uh, before we talk about household necessities? Yes, ma'am, I have a question. Okay, who's speaking? You're speaking to Snedlantla TV. My question is, what happens if the spouse maintains that loan and then after a certain time without telling the partner and then this, that, that person that maintains the loan dies? Do I, the remaining spouse, have to pay for that loan that was taken for by that person who dies without telling me about the loan? Because we are in a community of property marriage. Okay. Uh, the answer, I will say yes. Uh, yes, unless if you challenge uh, that loan. So the problem with death is, let's say uh, their spouse took the loan and then maintained it up until they die and then they did not take a, what is called a credit life uh, insurance to cover that debt. You firstly need to prove or to convince the court that you did not know about this debt and your deceased spouse was secretly paying for it. And this is something that becomes extremely difficult because you know that uh, the banks, they are just uh, financial institutions. They don't live or they don't know what happens in households. So whether you are telling the truth that you knew or you did not uh, know, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult. And then secondly, if uh, you were married uh, in community of property, when it comes to uh, what we call administrative of a disease estate, ne, the debt needs to be paid from the estate of your spouse. So you, as the surviving spouse, you will only be affected if uh, the estate of your spouse, let's say it is insolvent, and now the creditors want you uh, to pay for it as the surviving spouse. But if the estate of your deceased has enough money to cover that, then you as a surviving spouse, you will not really be, aff uh, you will not really be affected, understand? But for you to understand how this works, uh, you need to understand how administration of a deceased estate works and how debts are paid and all of those things before uh, in uh, inheritance can be distributed. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I hope I'm answered. Okay, can we move on to household necessities? Yeah. Okay. Yes, 
Ghosts who are married, uh, in terms of civil law, in other words, who are in a civil uh, marriage, ne? one of the other things that they have the obligation is to, like when they live together in one house, ne? they have a legal obligation to make sure that they provide for each other and they share household uh, necessities. For example, uh, Let's say in the kitchen, ne, uh, the both of them have a legal obligation to make sure that they jointly uh, use the stove. And then when in the fridge, they use the fridge, uh, food, when food is bought, there must not be this thing that you know what, this is my bread, this is your bread, and all of those things. Uh, cleaning services and everything, they need to jointly uh, use it, not just uh, the spouses themselves and also the children. The only exception here is if the parties are not living together in one house né? and the other uh, and both parties uh, are not in financial need, then the one spouse does not have a legal obligation to make sure that that other one has household necessities. You know, the basic things that we use every day. You understand? So also you need to understand that there is a difference between duty of support and household necessities. Ne? Yeah, you can so. have a duty of support, like you need to financially support me. Uh, let's say you evicted me from the house and uh, the court has <laughs> ordered you, or you have voluntarily agreed that you are going to provide for all uh, my needs. You're going to give me a, what is it, a certain amount of money every month, or you're going to pay for my accommodation, transportation, medical. Uh, needs and all of those things, but you don't have a legal obligation to make sure that you know what uh, I have clothes, I have all of those things. But also, it is important to note that the duty of support and the household necessities there is like a thin line between the between the two of them, because uh, one can say. The duty to support uh, technically also includes making sure that I've got household necessities. If I don't have food and I cannot afford food, if I cannot afford rent, then you as my spouse who can afford, uh, you have the legal obligation to make sure that I am able to afford all of these things. You understand? Does anybody have any question on household necessities, your your everyday things, these things that we use every day that we need just uh, to survive, if I can call it that way? Uh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, it's Andy Lesambo. Mm -hmm. um, on this question is household um, support. Um, in an instance whereby it's a customary marriage, um, separated, and maybe there's kids involved, but I'm working and able to maintain myself. Um, can your spouse still be liable to support you or assist you and without you putting in a maintenance order? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, again, let me say, we are going to have another session where we'll be talking about customary marriage. Ne? But to answer your question, if the spouses are in a valid marriage, whether it's a very civil marriage or a valid customary marriage, spousal support depends on are you in financial need. If you are working and you are able to support yourself, then uh, you are not in financial need. But there is nothing stopping your spouse from giving you, uh, from voluntarily giving you an allowance if they can afford to do so, or if they want to do so, understand. So let me say, let me say, uh, for the purpose of this discussion, uh, under these circumstances, disposal uh, allowance. Let me just say, it's just a a privilege that you are getting over and above uh, your salary. Your spouse has decided that you know what. I also want to give you uh, this amount so that you and the children are able to live this certain high lifestyle. 
You understand? Okay. But remember, you are not in financial need. Mm. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, anybody else? No. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, who's speaking? It's prudent. Prudent. Yeah. Okay. It's just a request. Can you move your slide from spousal maintenance to household necessary? Because it still it still shows on spousal maintenance here. Okay. Thank you. Can I, uh, Nemi, because we are about to finish uh, spouse uh, necessities, household necessities, and uh, we'll just uh, quickly talk about a uh, limitation of spouse's capacity to purchase a household necessities and then I want us to talk about the maintenance act. Hi, Ntavi. Uh, who's speaking? It's Queen, sorry. Okay, Queen. I just wanted to ask, is it possible that you can post those uh, slides on my UNISA because we, I don't seem to find them if you did. Okay, they have not uh, yet been uh, uploaded because we're having challenges at uh, the other time. And uh, mm. the person who's in charge, because all the announcements and everything, there is somebody who's in charge of that. We just sent the information. Unfortunately, uh, he has been on sick leave. Yeah? So that oh. was the other challenge that we have been uh, having. Understand, but as soon as they are back, everything from the first uh, session, everything that mm -hmm. I deem that you know it is relevant that you guys uh, must have, it will be uploaded, and he will send uh, what is the notice okay, on the my session. Okay. Uh, now I just want us to quickly talk about limitation of a spouse's capacity to purchase a household. Household necessities. Uh, you know that in life, you know, uh, we are all not very good when it comes to how we manage uh, finances or how we manage uh, how we run things in our household. And other spouses, they can tend to abuse their powers. Let me say their powers. Let's say, like for example, you. Uh, you are a wife and your husband is not working and you give your husband your credit card so that should he be in need uh, or should he need something, it's going to be easy for him uh, to have access to money. And then there he goes swiping everywhere and, uh, and all of those things. So this talks about that uh, circumstances under which a spouse can be limited to actually purchase household necessities. And this usually happens when their spouse tend to abuse uh, their powers or tend to be reckless in how they purchase uh, things or how, how they handle uh, the finances of the household. So. Uh, the limitation can firstly be done through a court order. Spouses who are married in community of property, because they have one joint estate and in, uh, in most of the time, uh, the household necessities, they don't need the consent of the other. A spouse who uh, can prove that their estate, their 50% of their estate is going to be prejudiced if their other is, uh, the other spouse is not stopped from managing uh, the joint estate, can bring a court application and request the court to suspend the powers or the capacity of the other spouse uh, or of the other spouse to handle it or to manage or to be able to buy anything uh, of the household. Somebody asked a question about what happens if a debt is taken without the consent of the other spouse. So this is a 
a remedy that can be used under that uh, those circumstances where you know you have a spouse who just goes oh, everywhere, just makes death, just makes death from Machonesa to you know all those uh, creditors or financial institution where they are just so relaxed and they don't really follow uh, the law strictly. So uh, the spouse who is prejudiced can bring a court application and request an order that that spouse uh, be suspended from ever taking out any credit without uh, having to go through the divorce process. We know uh, that uh, in order to terminate a marriage, uh, it can either be terminated either death or divorce, and then divorce uh, status changes from being married to singing. So if you don't want to file for divorce party, also let's say you don't want uh, to change from in community of property to out of community of property, you can ask the court that, you know what, I want to continue with my in community of property marriage, but I need to suspend uh, the power so that my spouse uh, cannot do anything. That is the first. Uh, the second one is if one spouse uh, orders the other spouse not uh, to ever buy things, not uh, to have any other powers, but this one, it becomes uh, extremely, extremely difficult because in South Africa, we no longer have a marital power. Husbands no longer have marital powers of, over their wives. So if my husband says to me, I no longer want you uh, to be in charge of the household to be able to buy anything, understand? So under what powers? Can you actually tell me that? Because if we are married in community of property, we are 50-50, so we cannot tell each other anything. And if we are married out of community of property, there is no joint estate. So you can post uh, me around and actually tell me what is it that I can do or I cannot do. So this one, uh, I can basically say the other spouse can... Uh, enforce that if you are those uh, spouses, either a husband or a wife who is submissive and uh, you listen to anything, if your spouse say, don't do that, you, like a child, you stop doing that. Hmm? You understand? And uh, last, before I, I, I move to the last one, uh, can whoever is talking, please uh, mute your mic. Oh, okay. Can uh, you please mute, mute, uh, mute your mic? Tracy, please mute yeah. your mic and your camera, please. Okay. Tracy, please mute your mic and camera. <laughs> okay, thank you, student. Uh, I see uh, is somebody raising his hand. I see there's a hand here, but it doesn't show me I... who's raising uh, their hand. It's Mildred. Mildred, okay. Yes. yes I just want to I just want to ask ma'am the limitations that you are talking about for the spousal capacity to purchase mm -hmm. the household necessity is it applicable onto the joint um account or is it to say maybe the other spouse then gives the other spouse who doesn't have the capacity financial capacity to buy things in the house and then in, he or she gives the other one the card to buy or oh, this okay. limitation will only apply to their joint, say, bank account. Okay, uh, I would say it apply. It applies to their joint uh, account because it must affect the other spouse. So if you buy, let's say, from your own account and the other spouse is not necessarily affected, then uh, the, there is no uh, limitation. You can't be stopped. So. It only applies if it jointly affects the both spouses. So if you are married in community of property, it automatically affects the two of you. Even if, let's say, you are buying from your own account. Because remember, if in my account you have got 100 rand, 50 rand automatically belongs to my spouse. So my spouse can argue that, but the way you are using uh, your account, you are being reckless and you are affecting me because 50% uh, of uh, the amount that you are using, they belong to me. But for those who are made out of community of property, 
uh, the limitation mm. can only occur if whatever uh, your recklessness now also affects my estate. Those who are married out of point of property with the accrual, Accrual, yes. yes, automatically gets affected because with the accrual system, how it works is by the way, we will talk about it in the next session. How it uh, works is one spouse, uh, the party, the party whose estate is lower, gets to share a uh, uh, half the difference uh, during the termination of the marriage uh, gets mm-hmm. to be given or gets to share half the difference from the other spouse. So if me as the spouse, I'm being reckless in how I manage my estate, it automatically affects the other one because it means that by the time uh, the time comes when we have to do an accrual calculation, I will be sitting on the and I will be claiming from your estate and the mm-hmm. reason why it will be that is because of the way I've been managing and how I've been reckless in also uh, the household necessities. You understand? So those who are married in community of property and those who are married out of community of property with the accrual system, the limitation affects them. Those who are married out of community of property without the accrual system, it affects them if the parties have a, a joint account where uh, they both contribute and the other one now is just reckless, which affects the other uh, spouses. Okay, thank you. Understood. Okay. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, uh, okay. The lobby, please accept them. Uh, uh, can you please uh, accept accept them? Are you able to accept them? Because I can't I'm, I'm see it from my I side. Can't. I'm also struggling from my side. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucidi. I see your hand is up. Hey, yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted you to ask if you can mute and switch off Tracy's end um video and and mic because it's very disruptive. Okay, I've got uh, 135 students uh, here, so I can't see Trace. I can see the video, but I can't see uh, where he is now. Can you just please press on the search button and just search okay. her name and then mute? It's very disruptive. Sorry. Tracy. Okay, I- I'm busy doing uh, doing that uh, while we continue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tracy, uh, is Tracy man? Okay, I found him. Okay, I've muted uh, her, but I don't know. Okay, disable camera. Okay, I found it. Okay, thank you uh, for that, for teaching me something. Now, the <laughs> last one is, you know, this technology thing. Uh, the last one is uh, the purchase was not necessary because one spot had made such a, uh, uh, let me say, was the purchase was not necessary because one spot had made sufficient fund available to the other. Basically, here is when a spouse argues that, you know, uh, you did not have to incur that debt because, uh, who's this now? You did not have to incur uh, any, uh, that debt because, I had given you enough uh, money or enough resources uh, for you to afford the household necessities. But uh, this argument was rejected in the case of Ren Lomel uh, versus Ramsey, where it was argued that a subjective uh, a subjective approach must be used. Because remember, uh, this defense can also, uh, what is it? The spouse can use this defense if a creditor, or a third party, uh, comes and says, "But you, as the other spouse, you must be liable because your spouse incurred this debt." And me as the spouse, I cannot say to the third party, but I had given my spouse enough uh, resources to be able to be able to afford whatever they have bought that had resulted in a, a debt being created. I understand. So I hope I was able to explain that. Does anybody have any question before we talk about the maintenance act? 
Anybody with a question? No. Can we move on? Yes, okay. yes, yes. It's just a, 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 a request. It's prudent. I got a request. Yes, yes, we are hearing you, prudent. Yes, um, I, I see you didn't touch the the test that the court uses to find out if the, if the, these were uh, household necessities, the objective and the subjective test. Can you explain a little bit about those two tests? Okay, just hold on. Let me go back to my notes. Okay, let me also... Uh... Okay. Uh, in order to... Uh, the court uses two approaches to determine whether the household uh, were necessities uh, or not. They use the objective approach and they also use the subjective, uh, they also use the subjective approach. For example, uh, the case that you must know is the Rollman versus Ramsey, where in this case, the wife had bought a, a dress, a, it's a silk a dress, and the wife was married to a husband who was well off. So uh, the creditor now came, or the store owner said, your wife has bought this dress, and you as the husband, uh, as the money maker, you need to be liable for this. In order to determine whether the spouse was liable for that, the court uh, firstly considered the objective approach. In the objective approach, the, co the court considers all the relevant all the relevant facts of the case to determine if the spouse acted within their capacity. For example, the court looks at the social background of the parties. It looks at the standard uh, the standard of living of the parties and the supply already. Uh, supplied in the family. For example, let's say the wife goes and buys a, a dress and buys these things. The court will firstly ask, uh, didn't the wife have any other dress, were they enough and everything? Or if it's the food, was there no longer food in the house and everything? That's basically the supply uh, in the family that it already has. In the case of uh, just hold on. In the case, in the case of Furter for Galent versus uh, Pretorius, here uh, the the court held that a husband will not be liable if he could uh, if he could show that there was an already an adequate supply of the specific commodity in the house. Let's use, for example, the food. Let's say uh, the spouse, the wife, goes and orders, uh, let's say they ordered food via the, what are those things that uh, we use on the app, uh, the Uber Eats, and they create a debt. Then the husband uh, can say, but uh, under this case, the husband can say, but in our, in our fridge, there is, a, and also in the grocery cupboard, there is enough food. So there was no need for my spouse to go and order additional food. Yeah? But uh, the, under the Renoman uh, case, again, they, they also use a subjective approach. And the court says the under the subjective approach, you only consider facts the dealer was away at the time. For example, if a spouse orders food uh, using a checkers 6060 thing, how will checkers as the dealer, as the store, as the shop know that in the household they already have a uh, food, they already have grocery? Understand? So those are the two approaches that I use: the objective approach and the subjective approach, and you need to know what uh, the Rollman, Rollman case says, and you also need to know what does the Furtergelsi uh, versus Pretorius case says when it comes to whether items, uh, the household, were they a necessity or they were not. 
Uh, does anybody have any question? Students? Can you hear no. me? Thank you. Yeah. We find Do you understand? Yes, we yes, find. Thank you. Yes, okay. we understand. Okay. Yes, yes ma'am. Now I want us to talk about the maintenance act. Yeah. The maintenance act is the legislation is the legislation that governs uh, maintenance in South Africa. It governs maintenance between people who have a legal obligation to financially support each other. This includes married spouses, spouses who, who are in a legally recognized marriage. And I am emphasizing legally recognized marriage because there are spouses who are married, but they are not in a legally recognized marriage. It also uh, regulates uh, maintenance between parents and children or uh, between children and their parents because uh, much as parents have a legal obligation to financially support their children, there is a legal obligation for adult children to financially support their parents. And uh, yeah, disposal maintenance is a maintenance between parents and children or adult children and their parents, and also legal obligation uh, for grandparents to support their grandchildren or grandchildren to support their grandparents. Yeah. And uh, for the purpose of this uh, subject or for the purpose of passing your exam, please, 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 you need to know what the duties of the maintenance officers are. You need to know the duties of the maintenance investigator. You need to know the difference between the maintenance officer and the maintenance investigator. You also need to know the powers of the maintenance court. If you thoroughly go through your textbooks, these are listed. Like if you can see here uh, from this document, I just divided them on the column. They are specifically stated what the duties of the maintenance officers are, the duties of the maintenance investigators, and most importantly, the powers that the maintenance court has you must know this thing. You also need to know the orders that the maintenance court can make. For example, uh, if you are in financial need and it is the first time that you are approaching the maintenance court, you need to know that the, the court can uh, give a maintenance order in your favor and you as the party who's bringing a, a a case a maintenance claim you are the maintenance creditor and your spouse is known as the maintenance data and uh, the court can grant a maintenance uh, order and also state the terms and conditions you must know that the court can grant an order uh, either monthly uh, payments or repayments, let's say every quarterly, or they can also order that a lump sum maintenance be paid. This is extremely important. You also need to know enforcement of a maintenance order. This occurs when the maintenance data, the maintenance uh, data does not or does not comply with the maintenance order. What happens when they default? What powers can the maintenance court uh, order? Uh, what orders can they give? Firstly, you need to know the civil sanctions that the court uh, can order against the, against the maintenance data. Uh, for example, uh, a rate of execution, that is uh, they can attach the movable asset. You need uh, to know about the emolument uh, attachment that is commonly uh, called uh, the Ganeshi order. And secondly, and most importantly, you need to know the criminal sanctions that the maintenance court can order if a spouse who has been ordered to pay maintenance defaults 
against uh, the maintenance order. Before I continue, is there anybody who has uh, a question? Because I can't see hands anymore, but I can see uh, there is a hand, but it doesn't show me whose hand is up. Does anybody have any question? Okay. Uh, when it comes to the cases, you need to know the Patane, uh, the Panatane versus the Panatane case and what it was uh, decided regarding uh, the maintenance and most importantly, if a spouse, uh, not, if, not a spouse, if a maintenance data violates the maintenance order. Please, it is very important because this will definitely be in your exam. Does anybody have any question before we talk about the matrimonial home? Anyone? Okay, can I continue? Hello, ma'am. Yes, we can continue. Hello, okay, ma somebody is saying hello. Yes, it's Vale Mokheng. Okay, Vale Mokheng. Sorry, can you repeat the case again? The Batanya. Okay, uh, can you see the document? Can you see the document? Hold on. Uh, is okay. this one? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, now I want us to talk about the matrimonial home. Ne? As uh, stated previously, spouses who are in a very civil marriage, they have a legal obligation to provide each other with accommodation. So if I get married to uh, my spouse and my spouse already has a house, I have the legal uh, powers to stay in that house, irrespective of the fact that my spouse acquired that house before we were married, and irrespective of the fact that we are married out of community of property. Although spouses uh, have a legal obligation to provide each other with accommodation and you cannot be evicted, there are certain circumstances that forces uh, spouses not to live in one house. And most of the time, besides those uh, who don't live together because of work purposes, if the home environment is toxic, if uh, the home environment, there is domestic violence, under those circumstances, it sometimes makes it impossible for spouses to live together. So it can happen that, let's say I get married and my spouse already has uh, their own house, but that spouse uh, is being abusive towards me and we've got my children. I can approach uh, the domestic violence uh, court and request that the spouse be evicted from their house. So a spouse has no right to evict the other spouse without obtaining a court order. And the court will only grant an eviction order if uh, it is in the best interest of the minor children or the court can say, let's say there are no minor children or there are no children at all. The court uh, can say, okay, uh, me as the spouse who feels that I am unsafe in this house, I can leave the house and my spouse must provide for me and pay for rent uh, in another accommodation or the owner can be the one who is evicted from that house. So the only exception under matrimonial home is uh, only if the environment is toxic, only if there is abuse can uh, an eviction order be granted. But also with that, there is an uh, uh, exception. Just because there is abuse, it does not necessarily mean an eviction will be ordered. The house environment must be such that one spouse must be evicted from the house, failing which either uh, the two parties are going to kill each other 
or it is not in the best interest of the minor children. The best interest of the minor children take precedence. They are priority. So that is one factor that the court looks at. If these factors are not here, then a spouse cannot evict the other one. It does not matter whether it is a rental accommodation or it is their own house. Does anybody have any question on matrimonial home and living together? Okay, can I move on to uh, the family name? Yes, please. Okay, uh, the family, uh, the family name. Uh, basically, we are talking about uh, the same name. Ne? When we, uh, okay, not when we get married. Uh, when spouses enter into a civil marriage, in most of the times, women will take the same name of the husband. But it is important to note that wives have a choice of saying, I either want to use a parallel surname, my maiden surname, my maiden surname, and my husband's surname, or they can choose to keep their own uh, maiden surname. There is no, uh, they are not forced. There is no legal obligation or uh, there is no legal duty or there is no legal, uh, yes. Uh, wives are not forced to take the same name of their husbands. Practically, we know that there are challenges with the Department of Home Affairs because uh, Home Affairs is the institution that registers marriage certificates. That is also where the same names are being changed. Uh, all our particulars are being recorded. There are challenges whereby a spouse, a wife will say, I want to retain my same name, but the home affairs will just change their same, their same name without the consent of that spouse. So this you can challenge uh, with home affairs and then it can be a uh, reversed, but what you must know for the part uh, for the purpose of this course is women do not have the legal obligation to use their husband's surname. When it comes to husbands, husbands cannot automatically use their wife's surname. If a husband wants uh, to use the wife's surname, they must firstly apply to the Director General of the Department of Home Affairs and request permission to use their husband's surname. Understand? So that is the difference between uh, the two parties, the husband and the wife. The husband must firstly request permission before they can use their wife's surname but the wife uh, has a choice without having to bring an application or having to request a permission uh, to use their husband's surname. Uh, does anybody have any question? I see Bali Mohen. Bali Mohen, do you have a question or a comment? No. Thank you, oh. no. Okay. Uh, I have a question, ma'am. Who's speaking? Uh, Shepard. Shepard, okay. Yes, uh, what you just mentioned, does it not amount to unfair discrimination? Uh, yes, and it does. Uh, has it ever been challenged? Uh, so far, it has not uh, been challenged because there is no precedent on it, but it is a, an, unfair, a, an unfair discrimination against males. And uh, for those who will be considering uh, doing family law, uh, their masters in family law, it's, it, it will make an interesting, uh, what is it, a mini dissertation, but it will be interesting firstly if uh, there can be a research done on other countries, uh, how do other countries deal with the issue of the family name of the same name and whether are there any other countries where husbands are automatically allowed 
to use their husband, to use their wife's surname without firstly having to obtain the permission from the relevant uh, departments. You understand? So it makes an interesting research uh, thesis. Yeah, for those, uh, consider it if you are interested in doing masters uh, in family law. Okay, any other question before we move on to the head of the family? Okay, can I move on to the head of the family, which is the last part under invariable consequences of a marriage? Uh, okay, as uh, some of you are aware, especially those from the black community in the black families, in most households, if not all, the husband or the man is head of the household. And it's also uh, something that is under common law. It was firstly legislated, but uh, it, was, uh, it has been removed from our legislation. So at the present moment, uh, under common law, a husband is the head of the household, but uh, on the, also on the same basis, it can be argued that he is not the head of the household because by saying the husband is the head of the household that automatically violates and infringes uh, the spouse's rights at the wife's house especially if when they entered into a marriage they agreed that we are equal partners and everything is going to be jointly done by the two of us. So if we do everything uh, equally, then how can it be that you, as the man, uh, you are regarded as the head of the household? So here, uh, most of the time, uh, the question that you will get is, is the man or is the husband still the head of the household? And to answer this uh, this question, you need to know that under common law, yes, the husband is the head of the household, but under legislation, uh, the husband is not the head of the household. The husband once had marital powers, but they no longer have marital power over their wives. Does anybody have any question uh, on the issue of men being the head of the household. Or does anybody have any question or uh, anything they want to say on the invariable consequences of a civil marriage? Not at all. Okay, uh, thank you students. Uh, thank you students, thank you for attending. <laughs> The next session, we will be talking about the variable consequences of a civil marriage. That is a uh, thing that we can change or spouses can change when they enter into a civil marriage, when they enter into a valid civil marriage. You will get a notice when the class is going to be, but it's going to be next week. Uh, thank you for attending and that will be all for today. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Okay, bye bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Before, before class. Okay, okay who's speaking? I hear somebody saying before closing. It's lucky. It's lucky. Yes, lucky. Please, next time, try whenever maybe you speak. Because the class is being recorded, try to move with the slides. Because whatever that you are saying, uh, it's not in line in Should line with the slides. the slides. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, I will. So I'm that. really concerned with uh, whenever you guys are posting this class, most of the people will be stuck, who will be confused because whatever you're saying, it's not in line, totally not in line with the slides. Okay, okay. Uh, apologies for that mistake. I will uh, fix it. Okay, no problem. Um, another question, quickly, please. Yeah, right.
I'm listening. Okay. Um, can, where can we access the recordings? Okay, I, I, I'm saving, I'm, I'm saving uh, them, and uh, they should be available. Uh, because I was told uh, they are available automatically like, the next day uh, on MST, but all the sessions have been recorded. So I will speak to uh, my team members just to see if they can be uploaded or whatever, but they have been recorded. Okay, thank you very much. Question. Okay, thank you. Uh, have a good day ahead. Ma'am, ma'am. Ma okay, who's speaking? To me, sir, um, ma'am. Okay, Timisang okay, Timi is the last one. Um, I'm in regards to family name, ma'am. What is the procedure in uh, in a same-sex marriage? Ma um, yeah. Okay, the same-sex marriage, they are allowed uh, to use a uh, barrel surname. Because uh, remember, their marriages are, uh, are regulated by the Civil Unions Act. So that makes provision for them. Okay. All right, thank you, ma'am. Okay. I have a question. Uh, okay, who's speaking? You're speaking to Tavisile. Okay, Tavisile, you are the last one. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my question is just regarding the access to the slides or the recordings. So I see that when you guys send on our emails, when we try to access it, sometimes it says we 